Every aspect of medicines development and supply is regulated by law. Now this starts with the development of a new drug and goes through the development, manufacturing, distribution and sale and supply of the medicine. So the focus here in this particular lecture is very much on the development and manufacture, but we'll briefly look at distribution as well. So it takes an average of about 10 years for a chemical compound to go from the lab to the pharmacy shelf as a medicine. Now during this journey there are many regulatory requirements which have to be fulfilled to protect the safety of patients and the public. So who regulates medicines? Well, medicines, medicines have been regulated since the time of Henry VIII. Um, the first comprehensive UK regulatory system was introduced in 1971. Now, they were introduced as part of the implementation of the requirements of the Medicines Act of 1968 um, and basically introduced the need for licences to be issued to provide authority to people or organisations to carry out the whole range of activities associated with drugs. So, licensing covered the manufacturer, sale, supply and importation of drugs. Now under um, the 1971 regulations it became unlawful to engage with these activities except in accordance with appropriate licenses, certificates or ex exemptions. So basically the regulations stopped people doing any of these activities unless a license had been granted um, and in issuing the license, the licensing authority, they have to be satisfied as to the level of risk to the public and patients. Now, medicines regulations was also an early activity of the European Economic Community in, of 1965, um, and UK requirements have always matched European requirements. Um, however, now the European Community legislation now takes precedence. Now, regulation focuses on the key aspects. Basically, is the product safe? Is the product of suitable quality? And is the product effective? Does it do what it claims to do? The balance between safety and effectiveness can be difficult. Um, in an ideal world, every drug would be 100% safe, but that's not the case. So we have to work on the balance of risk against benefit, with a clear emphasis on benefit outweighing the risk. So if we consider can cancer treatments, now people use them because it makes a difference between living and dying. However, they can make the patients very ill and they increase the risks of infection. So we can see from this example that not all medicines are 100% safe. Now, key organisations are involved in regulating medicines, and they are the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRA, and the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, M E M E A. UK is the licensing body for the UK, sorry, MHRA is the licensing body for the UK and they work closely with the EMEA. Now, the EMEA is at the centre of a collaborative network of national regulatory bodies within Europe and they're responsible for the scientific evaluations of applications for EU marketing authorizations for human and veterinary medicines in the centralised procedure. Now, the centralised procedure, what happens is companies, they submit a single marketing authorisation, otherwise known as an MA, and they submit that application to the EMEA. Now, when granted the market marketing authorisation, it's valid in all EU member states, not just in singular countries. Now, these, um, this centralised procedure is compulsory for certain medicines. For example, You've got the high-tech biote biotechnology treatments, and they include th such things um, as gene therapy. They are also include medicines to treat specific conditions, for example, HIV, AIDS, um, diabetes, cancer, um, and newer, newer degenerative diseases. And they are also compulsory for orphan drugs. These are medicines that wouldn't normally be commercially viable because they've been developed for rare diseases occurring in fewer than five in 10,000 people. So the centralised procedure ensures that these important medicines are automatically available in every EU member state rather than in individual countries. Applications for medicines which don't fall into these categories can be submitted to the EMEA as long as the medicine concerned is of significant therapeutic, scientific or technical innovation. Applications outside of these are processed by the National Authority, the MHRA. Now, the MHRA um, 
they cover around 20,000 different medicines available in the UK and they have marketing authorizations um, granted by the MHRA and only has been that's they've only been granted when the product has met high standards of the three vital components of safety, quality and efficacy. So how does a product get a license? Well, the marketing authorization is required before any medicine can be used to treat patients in the UK. And the starting point towards getting that marketing authorization is that um, the company uh, or the producer of that medicine needs to have permission to conduct a clinical trial. Clinical trials, um, their results are produced to the MHRA and they are assessed by the MHRA. If the results are acceptable, acceptable, then the product is giving a marketing authorization or a product license. Um, a key document that's required to, um, as part of the licensing process, is the summary of product characteristics, the SPC, and they are available online for many drugs um, on this particular website. And now within that document, it has to include name of the product, composition of the product, which includes actives the active ingredient and the excipients, the pharmaceutical form, the pharmacological properties, the clinical particulars and the pharmaceutical particulars. So those are things that that those that data needs to be within that document. Now treatments must be thoroughly assessed before widespread use. Medicines might work well in the lab, but in a clinical trial you might found, find out that it works well in some people um, and it's safe to use, but not in others. So clinical trials, they tend to occur in phases to allow this exploration. So phase one, now that usually involves healthy people and it's designed to find out how the medicine works in the body and to see if side effects increase at higher dosages. And this study often involves less than 100 people. If everything's fine and the results are safe, effective and of high quality, then a phase two clinical trial will proceed. And that examines whether the medicines work in patients with a particular condition or disease. Uh, they can also identify common short-term side effects. And the size of the cohort, so the size of the population that's tested, is around 700 people. In phase three, the aim, phase three clinical trial, the aim is to gather further information on how well the medicine works and how safe it is in the general population. It looks more in more detail at the range and degree of side effects, so the breadth of them. Um, and the results of these trials inform the labelling and patient information for the medicine when it's marketed. Now, the size of these trials can involve around several hundred to several thousand people, depending on the type of, of the trial. If the product receives a favourable result from this um, phase of clinical trial, the regulatory body will issue a marketing authorization otherwise known as a product license, to allow the product to be placed on the market. However, further monitoring must take place. So the monitoring, which is the post-licensing, it's impossible to know everything about the side effects of a drug when it's first licensed, okay? Because it's been tested in potentially thousands of people, but can be, it can end up being used by millions amongst the general population. And different people react to the same medicine differently. Some rare and unexpected side effects may only occur after the medicine has been in use for several years. Now, manufacturing problems may also arise and counterfeit medicines may also enter the supply chain. So there needs to be that monitoring to see if those occur. So who's involved in the monitoring? Well, there are several, several routes by which problems can be flagged up. You can have phase four clinical trial, um, and that's in information supplied by manufacturers from phase four clinical trials can show that there have been issues. The phase four clinical trials are carried out after the project, pro, product has been licensed, put on the market and prescribed to patients. These trials, they generally look to find out more about long-term harms and benefits of the medicine and disco discover new uses for it. Other routes by which problems can be um, identified, you, we have this reporting scheme which um, reports on side effects and that's the yellow card scheme. We can get alerts from healthcare professionals um, and that's via the black triangle. Um, research can be carried out on anonymized patient records. There could be quality checks on products by the MHRA. Or you could get tip-offs about criminal activity, so for example counterfeit medicines. So going back to the yellow card scheme, now this is a rapid detection and recording of adverse drug reactions. 
Um, and it's of vital importance so that unrecognised hazards are identified promptly and appropriate regulatory action is taken. Healthcare professionals, coroners and the public can report ADRs, so that's adverse drug reactions, to the MHRA by using the yellow card scheme. There is a um, website where the, um, the actual yellow card form can be found and it's completed. The yellow card scheme, even today, um, receives more than 20,000 reports of possible side effects each year. Um, and to give you an idea of um, how that's grown, half a million reports were received in the scheme's first, first 40 years. So we're still seeing a large number of reports. Now the black triangle, so if you open your BNF and you find a medication that's just recently come onto the market, you may find it has a black triangle next to it. And that's given to um, new chemicals and vaccines when they're put on probation for two years. Um, and the monitoring of drug safety is of this um, is commonly referred to as pharmacovigilance and all side effects should be reported to the MHRA. If there are quality or safety concerns, then manufacturers are legally required to report any important defects in medicines. The action taken is determined by the scale of the threat posed to the public's health. Now, warnings or alerts can be issued about defective medicines and side effects associated with medicines. And you can often see these in practice. They get um, issued um, via um, communication systems. So either via email, you get notifications, you can get faxes and various other means. Um, so the different types of alerts, so a class 1 alert requires immediate recall because the pro product poses a serious or life-threatening risk to health. Class 2 specifies a recall within 48 hours because the defect could harm the patient but is not life-threatening. Then we've got the class 3. That requires action to be taken within 5 days because the defect is unlikely to harm patients but is being carried out for reasons other than safety. Now something like that could be... Um, the wrong information on a patient information leaflet or the box has um, some defects that the medicine is in, something like that. And class 4 alert, you would advise caution to be exercised when using the product but indicate that the product poses no threat to patient safety. So that covers the marketing licensing of medication. There are other licenses um, which cover activities around manufacture and distribution. So obviously they would be called the manufacturer's license and the wholesale dealer's license. So the manufacturer's license covers those bodies um, who look to produce medicinal products. Um, they obviously need a license issued from the MHRA. Um, when the MHRA are assessing to, as to whether they should issue a license, they consider the operation of the business, the premises, the equipment, the qualification of the person in charge and the re re sorry and the arrangements for record keeping all of these must comply with the good manufacturing practice requirements um, and once all of these have been met the manufacturer's license can be issued the other license which we will um, come back to in a later um, lecture is the wholesale dealer's license now once um, manufactured medicines need to be distributed to pharmacists or other places that can sell or supply them to the public, um, you would need a wholesale dealer to undertake that activity. So wholesalers also need a license. Again, when the MHRA um, assess whether to issue such a license, they look at the premises, the storage equipment, equipment for distribution, production and storage records, name, address and qualifications of the responsible, farm, of responsible person. So this gives you an overview of the licensing around the manufacturing sale and supply of medicines in the UK. We've seen that there is both a European um, authority and a UK Euro, um, authority that regulate these activities.